so welcome everybody. Uh, this will be an interview with Lars Nicholson. Thank you, Lars, for accepting the, the, this invitation. My pleasure. So I'm Sarah Mahmoud. I'm a PhD uh, in informatics. I'm a PhD student in informatics. I work with intelligent systems and specialize in deep reinforcement learning. This event is organized by the PhD Student Council, and we are interviewing our Vice Chancellor, Lars Nicholson, who is um, he's our Vice Chancellor, and he has been also the head of the Department of Computer Science. And he was also the Pro-Chancellor and uh, at the uh, at the Yon Shopping University. He received his PhD in Computer Science from University of Sheffield in UK. His research focuses in applying AI algorithms in general and specifically learning algorithms and real world problems. So welcome, Lars. Thank you. So as this event is organized by the PhD Council, then we will start with your time when you were a student. <laughs> yeah. So what made you take the decision to, to have a PhD? The thing was that uh, this was in, uh, I have to go back to 1985, actually, when I started as a, a bachelor's student here at Kovde. Uh, and, and at that time, you know, it was a very immature university, uh, young, lots of opportunities for uh, young people to have a career within the university. So I was actually, you know, starting to work here at the university in 1986, and I was offered the possibility to go to the UK and study for my master's degree as a part of uh, my you know, competence development plan. They, the university focused on me and said, okay, do you wanna, do you wanna stay on? I said, yeah, sure. Then you have to go to England for a year and study to your master's degree uh, as a part of a scheme to build up a master's program here in Kovde in collaboration with University of Exeter as it was at the time. So I went to, to uh, the UK and the University of Exeter and studied for one year for my master's degree. And during that year, I met a professor uh, that was really inspiring. His name was uh, Professor Noel Sharkey. And he, he taught me all about, you know, learning based systems, artificial neural networks and so on. And I was really intrigued and inspired. So I, I when I came back to the university here, I was a part of, of you know the, the the lectures at the master's program, and I was uh, I was offered to to start a, a part time PhD uh, if I could find someone to supervise me. And I contacted Professor Sharkey at Exeter and asked, "Could you could you think about you know supervising me if I could find the funds?" And he said, "Yeah, sure, no problem." And the university here in Kovde kindly offered the, me the opportunity to to work part time and and and. Uh, take my PhD part time, so I was I was working here fifty percent and doing a part time PhD in starting actually in Exeter, and then uh, my professor Noel Sharkey he moved to um, to Sheffield and I sort of tagged along. You know how it is. You don't want to have a new supervisor to change your ideas and your methods and everything. So I I, I followed him to Sheffield and. Um, that's why I ended up in, in, in Sheffield actually as a PhD student. And uh, I was uh, coming, my background was, I was interested in artificial intelligence from uh, a more standard rule-based approach, uh, formal systems, logic-based approach here in, in, in Hoved and also in Exeter. And then Noel to told me about learning systems and how the brain works and how neural networks model you know, the, the, in, the finer details of how the brain works. You can model that in using algorithms and mathematical functions. And that I thought was really intriguing. And also how you could make computers learn. You don't have to program them. They learn things. And that was really intriguing. So that's why I, I started my, my PhD with Noel as a supervisor. And uh, my topic was really to to utilize and use computers uh, learning based computers to study and argue uh, you know how does the, does the human reason 
the, the traditional sort of approach was that uh, we have a, a, a language of thought, which is grammatically organized and you do symbolic transitions like formal logic, you know, you deduce new facts from facts and rules and variables and stuff. And the idea, the general idea was that the brain works in the same way uh, as a sort of a structure sensitivity to, to a, a language of thought. And I thought, that's weird. The brain doesn't look like that at all. And I saw the power of learning based system based on artificial neural networks. And I couldn't mix those two sort of theories. So that's why I started to argue that, no, I don't think uh, we have a language of thought of that nature. I think we are definitely uh, organized internally and we reason the same way that the brain works with patterns of activation over ne ne neurons in your brain and the, 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 the question then for me was to okay so how do you explain the fact that we appear to be you know following rules and learning to generalize from rules which is not the strong point of, of neural networks so that's how I started the, the uh, my approach and, and my uh, formulating my, my problem and it was all you should remember a part of you know my competence development plan here in Hovde. so I was I was destined to work here and I was I was sent across the seas to sort of uh, have a competence development and, and, and help to build first the master level education here in Hovde and then you know a, a little bit later the, the PhD level so that's that's how it all started, actually. Nice, very nice story. <laughs> and when seeing that you focused on computer science, your bachelor, your master, your PhD, does, does it mean that your road was so clear that you were both so focused that okay, this is what I want to do? Not really. Uh, I actually, my working career started out very very differently. I started out as a as a bicycle repairman. Uh huh. <laughs> Uh, and then I, you know, I, I, I was rather late in using computers. I saw my, I used my first computer when I was 23. I had nothing, oh. you know, no experience in, in using computers or, or programming and stuff like that. But I was really intrigued by the fact that you could, you know, use computers to program them and, and th they could do stuff and also add on to that, that ability to learn new stuff. That was really amazing. And that caught my, my attention and interest. And I spent numerous hours, late nights, you know, here at the university programming and, and, and teaching computers to do things. So it was really, that was something new, a, a new world actually opened up. So I wasn't really scheduled for that. And just, that just happened to me, for me, I would say. Very interesting. And then when you see your PhD title, <laughs> yeah, systematicity, the scarlet pimpernel of cognitive science. Yeah. <laughs> who, who is the director? <laughs> <laughs> this is well. This is this is it. Actually, I had to to find it in my basement. And this is you wow. know I, I'm <laughs> celebrating now. Uh, I have a celebration this year, uh, an anniversary actually. It's 25 years ago since I took my PhD diploma. Wow, congratulations. And it's 30 <laughs> years ago since I started. And these are the only copies I have. Uh, I don't wow. have them in electronic format, just a paper format. And the title, you asked about the title. And it, it, uh, it, the systematicity, which is the concept that I sort of addressed, uh, that was. Uh, the notion that you have a language of thought and uh, the processes in the mind were structure sensitive systematicity. They were systematically sensitive to the s linguistic, uh, formal, grammatical structures of how we, we reason. And uh, that was the, the main thought or, or, or a, a general and a very common idea within cognitive science. And I, I was strong this. I had strong disbeliefs about that. And every time I tried to get closer and, and show, that, look, I can have these computer networks or, 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 or artificial neural networks exhibit the same kind of behavior, but they're not based on rule-based systems and, uh, and grammatical sensitivity. They changed the definition. So it was like, ah, I'm chasing a ghost. And you know the story about the Scarlet Pimpernel being, you know, during the... the the, the uh, French Revolution to, to have a nobleman uh, 
uh, and women uh, escaping from, from France. So there was elusive target and that's the title, which I thought was quite, you know, creative in a sense. So that's why, <laughs> why it's, it's yeah. named. It was very catchy, yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Would you, would, you, like would you advise the students to do the same, to bring these catchy novel titles? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, uh, it doesn't really say very much about the content. So I think mm -hmm. you know, if you don't, if you're, if you're, I, I think, I would, I would not, uh, you know, suggest that to you guys because it would much, it's much better to have a title that describes the content because the, then mm -hmm. your thesis will be easier to find uh, and your knowledge will be easier to find. Mine is sort of hidden within this interpretation, within this interpretation of what, what actually the content is. Mm. So, <laughs> but I, 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 I find out, I found out when I read it the other night that I was kind of, you know, had a sense of humor for things. So there are some interesting uh, uh, quotes in it and so on. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's hard to get now. You have to find a copy in the British Library, I think. I don't have a, an electronic copy that I could send to you if you're interested, but uh, mm. there is a copy in, in the British Library, at least. Yeah, sounds interesting. I tried to find it, but I couldn't, yeah. <laughs> nah. I don't, as I said, I don't even have a, an electronic version of it, so it's, it's hard to find. I have a, this, this is actually the copy that I took to, to the defense, uh, which is rather different in the UK compared to the Swedish form of defense, I have to say. Yeah, sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. And talking about the comparison between Sweden and the UK, you probably face a big difference in the culture, in the way they do the PhD, mm -hmm. and maybe the supervision and other, what I call it, challenges. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, there is, uh, was, and I th think it still is a big difference between the, the British system and the Swedish system. For, for instance, there were no coursework. So we don't have any, we didn't have any courses. If you needed to, 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 uh, to learn something new and have a skill or, 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 or experience, you had to find it. You had to read a book and you had to uh, attend other courses, but you weren't examined on that and you didn't get any course credits. You, had, you were expected to, to, to acquire that knowledge, uh, the, all the knowledge you needed actually. So that's one difference, I think. Uh, the other difference is that uh, the uh, the 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 defense is rather different. It's not an open def defense as it is in Sweden. You know, there is a public event where you defend your thesis. That's a closed event. So I only were examined by I was examined by two examiners: uh, one internal examiner from the department and one external examiner. So that it was more of a, a, an exam, uh, really. So the outcome could be one out of five. You could pass without revisions, pass with minor revisions where the internal uh, examiner could, could uh, okay them. You could pass with major revisions when the examination committee would uh, meet again. Or you can have a conversion uh, means that th this is not this is probably good research, but it's not enough for a PhD. It could be a, a licentiate or something, and then you can have outright fail. So there are it's actually an examination of, of various or a different type than in Sweden. If if the Swedish system works, then the actual defense or, or the the viva is is more of an open. Uh, event where you sort of present your work and it's questioned by, by, by uh, knowledge, uh, people with the knowledge about the area, but it's not really, the outcome is, is, is seldom uh, very um, surprising. You, you pass, but that's different in the UK. And then of course, I was a part-time overseas PhD. So I was sitting here in Hövde doing all the work. Uh, and my, I have my supervisor in, in in, in England, so we d we had to develop a, a, a different type of, of uh, supervision. Of course, I couldn't get to him every day. Uh, I, I had to send manuscripts to him and he read them and sent them back to me. So we developed 
Uh, and I think that's good, actually. And I, I would encourage all of you guys to do that, too. Uh, he, he actually encouraged me to publish a lot, to, to write articles, to, to, to present my work at, at seminars uh, here in Skövde and in other places, to, to publish papers in conferences and, and utilize the whole uh, you know, academic community or scientific community to, to develop my work. And that was, uh, I think, a very good thing for me. And it actually helped me pass the whole uh, experience because halfway through, I really thought, okay, I have done all the things that I you know, set my mind to do. And this is not enough for a PhD. Where do I go from here? I had no idea. And my supervisor couldn't really help me out either with, with clear ideas on how, how to proceed. But I was really fortunate because at one of these conferences that I presented one of my papers, uh, a philosopher from uh, actually originally from, from Australia said, I read your work and I thought about this route forward. Do, do you want to collaborate on that? And I said, yes, please. <laughs> and that was, it was really, ah, here's a clear pause uh, onwards towards the final uh, goal of having my PhD. So that really utilizing the scientific community helped me in, in achieving actually th this um, uh, the task of, of producing a, a complete PhD uh, and also defending it. So that was, that was very, very useful. Uh, and also you have to remember this is, you know, early or mid, early mid nineties and, and the, the, the culture here was really different. There were few uh, people with a PhD. So there were few doctoral uh, people with doctoral theses. So, uh, we were a, a, a bunch of PhD students that also collaborated and helped each other. So, and I think that's a, a good experience and, and a good suggestion or, or advice to you guys is utilize your, your fellow PhDs and, and the opportunities to present your work at, at various workshops and conferences, because that will definitely help you get new ideas and, and also utilize other people that have ideas about your work. And as I said, that really helped me, definitely. Well, sounds excellent. You mentioned an important point about this networking with others, not only with your community at the university or with your supervisor, this limited group, but to network with others, maybe in conferences and events. I think this is a very important point that many PhD students are afraid of. They feel that, okay, after I finish this, I will be able to communicate. Now I'm not ready enough. Yeah. What would you say about it? Have you faced the same? Oh yeah, definitely. And and I think that I was fortunate in a sense because I was, as I as I said, I was working here part time as a as a lecturer, and I was I was used to presenting stuff to an audience. That was no problem. And uh, I actually had to help some of the students, the the English students, uh, PhD students at conference to get uh, confidence in us enough to present their work because that is hard the first time because you have a critical audience that ask you, uh, you know, hard questions and so on and 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 I think you need to to uh, sort of get used to that and I had a trick that I used when I became a supervisor for my PhDs, I, I, I took them to, to conferences and I, I, I found uh, some talks or, or, or presentations where I thought, you know, this will be, uh, this talk will be given or this presentation will be given by a person that could probably learn how to speak English, but probably not understand, you know, and answer questions in a good way. And, and it was like nice deliveries, but they weren't really fluent in the, in the language. And, and that thought, that gave my PhD students a, a confidence. I can do that better. I could really do this. And I think that's, that's one way of doing it, you know, because you need to do it. You need to have that confidence and, and training uh, to, to, you know, face an audience where you might have critical views, and and and, uh, and of course, that's that's the way academia works and research works. Your your ideas and so thoughts and methods should be questioned by 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 others, and 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 you need to to uh, to to get it used to that. And I think that 
the ability and, and the experience to, to work as a teacher is, really helps you uh, face that, I think. Yeah, great. <laughs> well, you've mentioned several challenges that you had, but if I ask you to, to say one particular challenge that you see that this is the main challenge I had when I was a PhD student, what would it be? I, I think it was actually the, um, the limited academic environment, you know, close to me here in Kovda. As I said, I had, I had a few uh, researchers, uh, doctoral students that were working in the same fields. So I was really alone in that sense. So I had to use the international community for that. And of course, that is something you don't do every day. You, you write your paper and you go to a conference uh, and it doesn't happen, you know, so many times per year. So I think that was probably the, the challenge to have a, a rather limited local environment where you had, you know, uh, fellow researchers uh, and the experienced people within my field. I was almost alone. And mm -hmm. that was a challenge, I think. And, and as I said, I was... I was really helped by the fact that I, I found other people in the world that could really guide me and help me and challenge me. So that's probably the, 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 the main challenge I had. And that's also so, something I, I'm bringing into my management these days is, is the intention and the focus to build these, uh, you know, we sometimes call them complete environments where you have B BSc students, MSc students, PhD students and researchers working within the same area because you need that mixture of, of competence and people in order to challenge your ideas and, and learn and, and, and develop. So I think that's very, uh, it's a very important lesson, I think. And that was hard. Uh, in the early days, days here, here in Kovda. Now it's it's much much better, I think. Yes, <laughs> it's something. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, yeah. the, the, another challenge was that you know today we have this this uh, way of meeting. It's easy to connect and it's easy to send files all over, all over the world and, and your work. Then you have to remember, we could only send text files. So there was no graphics, nothing. So, you know, I had to do everything like in, in, in LaTeX form or very close to, to HTML. <laughs> oh, sorry, HTTP, you know, uh, formats uh, and so on. Uh, so that was also a challenge. Uh, the development has been quite good in exchange, uh, in, in, in offering new opportunities to exchange ideas and to interact. And that was, that was, harder than I think. Yeah, and mentioning that you were almost doing a distance learning, I think that makes it even more challenging. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> except I have to say, when I, I, I went to, the, to, to my supervisor a couple of weeks per year, and then all the other PhD students in the department in, in Sheffield were very sort of jealous because I got access to him. Uh, I, I could spend, you know, a whole day with him. And that was, that was good. Yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah, you can take it both way as a yeah. positive or negative thing. And talking about that, going back to, to Hofte, so after you finished, after you finished your PhD, going back to Hofte, that was a bit strange. Usually people either explore new places or they say, oh, this university is underrated. I would look for some place better. So how was your view to come back to Hofte again? The thing is, I, I was... I was here most of the time, <laughs> you know, I, I was sitting here doing all my PhD work and I was only, you know, sometimes in, in, in Sheffield and, and sometimes at conferences. So I was, I was working here all the time. So it wasn't really a, a sense of coming back. I was here all the time, but as I, as, as I said earlier, it was, uh, it was different than then. It was a young university. It was only 20 years old at the time. So it was also full of new opportunities. You know, you could create things. You could, uh, you could, uh, I, I started the, the, the research group, SAIL, that Jöran is leading now. I, I see him there uh, in, in, in the crowd. So I started that in 1991. And it was easy to get funding, grants. The first grant I got was actually to, to uh, detect oil spills in, in water 
by using radar imagery. It was easy to organize conferences. You know, I organized three large conferences by the support of the university. So, you know, it was, it was possible to do things. And uh, it was also, it, it was a, a sort of a, 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 an open field where you could create stuff. You could use all the experience you had with projects, with research to build the group and start to think about developing the, the master level programs and also, uh, you know, an idea that someday we should have our own, uh, you know, permit to uh, offer PhD diplomas. So that was really a, a goal that I took back and I said, this is the type of culture and, and uh, environment that I would like to create here in Skövde. And it wasn't at the time. So, and, and then, of course, we had... Later on, we had uh, you know additional people coming in, like Stian. I saw Stian in, in, in the crowd too. You know, so we started to uh, hire people here uh, and build a, 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 a more of a, a research culture and structure uh, that wasn't uh, there when I started. You know, in, in the in the early nineties. So that was that was that was nice. Yeah, I like this mentality of thinking about a growing university or a growing place as an opportunity to provide more mm -hmm. instead of I'm looking for somewhere that is already established and I'm gaining from it. So this mentality of mindset of giving instead of mm -hmm. just getting, I think mm -hmm. this is very interesting. And I, I also think that that relates to, you know, the, the um, to, to research, you explore new things, uh, you create new knowledge and you, you, you inform other people about that knowledge. You have an idea that that was really, uh, interesting at that time because you could you could actually make your ideas come through with the support of the university. Uh, so that was that was really uh, interesting and, and and rewarding, I think. So we, I actually, I remember we had. Uh, I talked about these conferences conferences that we organized. We had the opportunity to invite you know the top people in the world from Stanford and, and John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins and, and so on, uh, to come to Skövde, you know, to be on, on top of Mount Billing and the very impressive mountain we have here in Skövde and, and attend the, you know, conferences and discuss really interesting matters about thinking machines. And that, I really thought that was amazing, you know, what we could do. And, and um, I really enjoyed that, I have to say. <laughs> Very interesting. And then, I mean, you should remember, we were just PhD students at the time. I, I, I remember at one point I was really uh, approached by a, a, a researcher in another uh, Nordic country said that, oh, you shouldn't do these things, organize international conferences, you should let real researchers do that. But we didn't have any, so I had to. <laughs> so it's, I, it was nice, it was good. Yeah, yeah, I think this felt the characteristics of the PhD student or a, or a PhD yeah, student. yeah, naive and, and explore, explorative and uh, really eager to do things. And, and uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm in no doubt that that is a, a, are actually uh, opportunities that you have to uh, and uh, approaches that you that you apply also. And, and um, I, I, I really think that PhD students are very important for the development of a university uh, mm. because they are they are young creative and they sometimes don't see the old boundaries so they, they, exp they sort of challenge those boundaries and, and create new stuff and that's something we should should uh, listen to and adopt new fields new ideas new ways of doing things um, and uh, I, I think that's something that is really worth pointing out. Yeah, I think students are the ones who bring life to university. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, 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 you are the oil of, of, of the university, I think, definitely. As, as our, one of my former bosses said, it was, he was the boss of the computer science department. He said, logic is the oil of computer science. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a more of a traditionalist, I have to say. <laughs> yes. And then your relation with your students, you became later a supervisor yourself. Mm -hmm. 
how was your relation to your, to your student? What do you think makes a good supervisor? I think that's hard to to uh, to say actually. I what I what I brought with me was uh, the things that I had had been very useful to me. One was, as I said before, the uh, the idea to encourage my PhD students to publish, to mm -hmm. utilize the uh, the scientific community and 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 put forward their ideas and be challenged by that because that's something that I I find is really really useful and also as my supervisor did he was actually the one that that. Uh, gave us the opportunity to invite very famous international people here to have the utilize uh, the, the network of the supervisor. The supervisors often have a network of, of contacts and I think that they should share that with their students and, and uh, you know, exploit the opportunities that, that, that these contacts can offer. Mm. So I, I think that's, that's one of the things that I, I think is, is uh, is important to, to do. And, and also I, I, I feel that, you know, as supervisors, we have to have a sort of a long-term idea of, you know, how a certain research field should develop so that the PhD students can get a, a context to work within. So we, we are not really only focusing on shorter projects uh, one year projects, two year projects, and so on. It has to be for a PhD student, it has to be a five year project at least. Otherwise, you know, you, you risk uh, focusing the first couple of years in one direction and then do a 90 degree turn and then focus something. That doesn't make a thesis. A thesis has to be coherent and, and focused. So that I think that's a challenge and, and, uh, and our role as supervisors and researchers is, is to, to find the, the, the long-term development of a field and how different views and, and ideas and the problems can fit into to addressing the, the important issues within that field, because that would help PhD students also to find a sort of a rough idea of a problem that is, 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 um, is, uh, important to address. Yes. And how do you compare supervision between UK and Sweden? I don't know. I can't really say. I only have, I only have uh, one experience of, of, of UK supervision and that was my, my supervisor. I think I, actually that it's rather individual. You have various types of, of uh, supervision styles. I, I saw a, a a program on TV once about, I think this was in the US, and that really affected me because that was about, uh, about a researcher, a very famous researcher who used his PhD students to explore various uh, opportunities and ideas that he had. Some of these ideas and routes were very successful, and the, the, the PhDs that were lucky to get those ideas, they, they were very successful and they passed their PhD exams and were very famous. And those who were unfortunate and got bad ideas or not so profitable you know, ideas, they failed. And I think that, that really struck me. I was appalled when I saw that because then the PhDs were used as tools for a researcher for a supervisor, but that, that's not the, the role that they should have. They are supposed to be trained to become individual researchers, independent researchers, and, and they should not be used as tools. And that really affected me. And I swore to myself, I will never become such a supervisor. I should really try to help them out and, uh, and uh, explore their own you know, opportunities and ideas and, and, and so on. Uh, and I, I tried to, I've been very, you know, my, my thesis is, is rather philosophical and, and uh, in the, uh, in, in between cognitive science and computer science, uh, uh, and uh, it doesn't really develop society as much uh, as I would, as I later liked to do. And I, I moved into more applied research using the, the uh, possibilities with learning systems. And I tried to, formulate you know projects that 
uh, were addressing real world problems uh, in collaboration quite often with industry. And uh, I tried to, to get PhDs to, to um, be part of that. Uh, journey or, or, or that work so that they would have a context and they would have a, a, a stable funding for the for the years that they were PhDs and also connected into a, a larger scale uh, area like the one that Stian and, and I worked on on information fusion which was a very very nice idea where we collected lots of researchers and gathered lots of researchers in order to find you know different methods of of collecting data from various sources sensors databases and so on and apply various methods for extracting new knowledge and sharing new knowledge and and, and so on so that was that was really uh, the heyday i think of our research when we had that you know idea that covered lots of fields computer science and engineering and so on and that was really good i think we, we could put it, all of us into a certain context and, and addressing important issues. So, so that's, th those are some of the points uh, that, that I think is, um, uh, is something that is important for a supervisor. Definitely not see the, the, the PhDs as tools, but rather to, to support them in their development and, uh, and goals. Uh, that's something that I, I try to do. And also, I, I have to be, be honest and say that, of course, I use the PhDs as tools because when I started to supervise, I, at the same time, became a manager, as you said before, Sarah, the head of department and then later vice chancellor and so on. So, so PhD students were actually a, a way for me to follow the, uh, the front line of, of my research field because I... I I didn't have time to do my own research. So I learned a lot from my PhDs uh, all the time. And I was really efficient in the sense that they had ideas and, and explored stuff. And I was just receiving mature ideas, mature reasoning and results and so on. So that was really nice, I think. Hmm. So in a sense, yeah. they were tools, but not, not in the, the wrong sense, I think. Yeah. I think the uh, supervisor affects the future of the PhD student a lot. So how yeah. was your, yeah. your face after the PhD? How was your life after the PhD? Uh, from becoming a researcher and suddenly becoming a manager from research yeah. to management. <laughs> I think it was, uh, well, I, as I said, uh, my, my PhD was rather philosophical and it was a more a philosophical debate. It, it did move society forwards. Uh, and I, I was interested in, in, in utilizing the knowledge uh, that I had on learning algorithms to apply that knowledge to real world problems. Uh, so I, I, I applied for and, and received lots of funding for you know, applied problems. Uh, so I managed to, I ended up managing lots of projects. So I became a project manager uh, and trying to, to, uh, to use those projects as building blocks for, for building, you know, contribute in building the, the department. And, and that sort of caught my interest, you know, the managerial part of project management. I thought that this is, this is quite nice. Uh, so that's probably why I ended up being a sort of a manager, not only for, for research projects, but also for departments and, and now finally the university. And I, I think it's, I, I think that's, that probably stems from, from, from that experience. It's nice to see, to have a goal, to, to do things in order to achieve that goal. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's why I, I ended up in, in, in in managing, as I said, not only projects, but, you know, larger and larger projects. And now, you know, I have this six year project of, of managing a, a university, which is, is rather nice, I have to say. I don't know if how that do answered you your question. But <laughs> 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 and how do you feel this research contributed to being a manager? Like a researcher is usually a risky person exploring things while a manager should be like responsible for thousands of students and employees. How how do you think the difference between being a researcher and being a manager? I think I, I, I don't think there's that big of a difference. You know, 
a researcher uh, identifies the problems, finds solutions, uh, conduct work, uh, evaluates, you know, how, how did this work actually contribute to solving my goals and then redefine the goals and start that cycle all over again. It's the same, you know, being a manager, you, you know, where do we want to go? What's the goal and how do we do it? What are our strategies? How well do they work? You evaluate that, you readjust and so on. So I, 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 I see lots of diff, uh, similarities in, in, in these two. And, and there are at least two types of managers, those who are sort of developmental and I think I'm one of those I like to develop uh, and stuff uh, and, and um, the structures and, and, and the university and and that really to me is very similar to a researcher you want to develop you develop ideas new ideas uh, you challenge those you find new directions and so on so I think there's a, a big similarity in that and then of course there are managers who, who want uh, to be more conservative, do the same thing all over again, but maybe with a, a bit of higher quality every time. I'm not one of those. I, I like to develop stuff, and, and the, when when everything is developed, and I just manage, you know, the, the general iterative same movement every year, then I, I I think that I will become bored. I'm not there as yet uh, here. I think there are still stuff to develop. So I, I think there are lots of similarities and you have to be as careful, you know, in, in your research as you are as, as a manager, you have to take care of the methods you work with and the tools you have and so on. So I, I think there are lots of similarities, definitely. I've learned a lot about model. And then I think also my area, computer science and, and model building and so on has helped me to, to formulate models of, of, of lots of issues that I could just look at the model, change the model, the way I work and so on. So it's, I think I've been really helped by, by the area that I have been, you know, working within, definitely. So would you say that you are excited with the current challenges that the university is going on? Like the pandemic is one of them, but other yeah. challenges as well. <laughs> I, I have to say, I'm, I'm not that keen on, on the pandemic, but... <laughs> challenge I think I, I rather would have avoided that one but I, I really am interested in, in, in the phase that we are uh, at, at the moment I think we have we have learned stuff we are definitely in a position where we try to find areas where we build as I said before these complete environments we, we try to have education at all levels basic BSc level, MSc level, PhD level. And now we are in, in the very, very exciting challenge of, of formulating and trying to get our second permit to issue PhD diplomas within you know, health and, and digitalization. And I think that's really, really uh, an interesting development and, and really strategic for us. If we have that, then we have two large areas uh, of, of interest for, for our university. And, and I think that's really, uh, an interesting development to be part of, definitely. Uh, and, and these are rather sort of lengthy processes. I remember we handed in our first application to uh, the P uh, permit for a, a PhD education or, or, or issuing PD PhD diplomas within information technology in 1999. And then we handed in the, the, the second one in 2009, so 10 years. Of development and um, but that that sort of uh, effort paid off in the end uh, and it was it was a great day it was probably one of the best you know academic uh, the days in my academic career when we had the the right when we got the right to issue PhD diplomas within information technology that was really something that made the whole uh, the ten years worthwhile and I'm sure that will be the be the same experience when we get the next uh, permit yeah. in, 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 in not so many, in a not so far uh, future or distant future. Yes, I agree and I hope for the best as well. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you envision the future of education research and the environment, the working environment of the university in the short term and on the long, in the long term? No, I, I think uh, in in the, in the long term, I 
I, I feel the same way I always felt, you know, the, 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 the last 20 years of being sort of uh, in, in some capacity of a manager. I, I feel our ambition to build uh, these, this profile university where we, we don't do everything. We do a few things, but we try to those, do those things with high quality uh, and, and connect research and education close together. I think that's important. Uh, and I, I still, I, I think that idea is uh, a driving force for me and we are working towards that. Uh, and I think that's it's also, it's probably rather provocative to say, but I, I think that if we are doing that and we are doing that well, we will challenge the whole academic system in Sweden because then the broader universities, they can't just sit back and relax and, and, and be uh, you know, outrun by us in their, some of their fields. They have to, to, to find these profiles too and, 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 and concentrate their work. So I think we're definitely shaping, we are shaping the whole academic um, you know, sector in Sweden. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that's a bold statement, but I think just to have those goals and ambition, I, I really see the, the, the strength in us. So that's the long term idea and goal. In the short term, I have to be realistic and, and, and realize that that's not possible in all the areas we want to be active in. So we have to, we, we have to utilize our, our collaborative strength and collaborate with others uh, in order to to collaborate on, let's say, research education. Well, we've done that. Before we had the rights to, to issue our PhD diplomas, we were engaging in, in formal uh, agreements with other universities so that you know, people like me could act as a primary supervisor without, without you know, the university having those rights. So that's, that's probably the only thing that I'm, uh, I'm a little bit disturbed by. I worked so hard for with lots of other people uh, as well for the the, the right uh, to have the, the the opportunity to offer PhD diplomas here in Skövde, but no one of my PhDs have their degree from Skövde. They have it from you know, uh, Sheffield and Exeter and uh, Linköping and Örebro, but not from here. But and I I I think it's too late now. I had my last PhD. Uh, finished in uh, 2013, so it's. Uh, I, I, I say I, I am saying lost because I think it's the last one. I don't have the ambition or the idea to 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 supervise any more PhDs. Um, yeah. So you wouldn't say that you miss being back to research and supervising students? No. Well, you think I, I see. No, I, I, I don't miss <laughs> that because I can get it for free. You know, we have the environment, lots of, of, of skilled researchers from PhDs to, to you know, old uh, uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, the, you know, that share their knowledge. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very fortunate in the, in the sense I could just go to a lecture and attend and, you know, be, I, I, I could be served the latest knowledge and I don't have to find it myself the best time or the best day of the year i think is researchers night or forskar freda in swedish where you know researchers present their work to a general public and it's so amazing to just walk around and listen to all the fantastic stuff and research that we do and i think that's amazing that's the amazing thing about working at the university access to knowledge is so easy and that that's that's something that I think we should exploit much, much more in uh, in, in supporting a, a, a more, uh, you know, seminar culture so that we share and, and, and make our knowledge available to others. Like this is a good example, you know, the, I'm not saying I'm just sharing my experience, not knowledge, but experience. And I think that's, that's something we should we should do because we could we could learn from each other much, much more than than we do. And, and I think that's the major benefits of being at the university. We are, we're spoiled in that sense. Yes, I agree. And I think current students, the, the ones who have joined after the pandemic, I think they are losing a lot from not having these communication. So I think providing digital uh, events as much as possible would be an alternative to what they are currently missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like the envision that you had about improving the education, the research and the environment. 
how would you see so it's not just the vice chancellor who is um, responsible for this it's also the other management uh, team the supervisors the students even what would you say for each of those so what would you say for the students to the supervisors and to the management that we have here in the in this event right i think i i think to all i would suggest or or, or give the advice that as i said we should utilize the fact that we have very skilled people here uh and uh listen to what they have to say share our knowledge and listen to what others have to say i think that's one of the major benefits of working here as i said uh to the researchers and supervisors uh, i said that previously but i think the, they're they're my advice to them, you know, how they could contribute to the, the vision of building this, you know, complete university or a uh, very um, high quality university in, in the fields that we have chosen is to, to have these long term views. Where are we heading with our uh, research in research areas, not only focusing on the next project, the next project, the next project. How are Rather, the, the projects used as building blocks for reaching a longer term vision. I think that's my, my advice or, 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 or wish rather <laughs> that the, the, the researchers and supervisor, uh, supervisor would do because that would also create a good environment for the PhD students. To the, the um, administrators and managers of the university, including myself is to, uh, to support that vision, you know, to, to do our best to, to support uh, the, the creation of these um, coherent environments and, and profiled research groups uh, so that, you know, we could uh, explore our common knowledge uh, and, and create processes that support that to, to, to help out to, to, to let's say, make it possible to organize conferences and uh, different meetings so that we actually could share that knowledge between us and, and support our researchers in, 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 in um, uh, applying for research funding uh, to, to, to create this, this uh, common uh, sort of research groups uh, uh, and profiled areas that we are, are um, trying to do and, and be open to other the, uh, you know the ideas of others i think one of the 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 positive strategies that we have adopted here at the university is to to find these cross uh, dis dis disciplinary areas where we uh, work together, let's say computer science and healthcare to find those those areas in between, which is hard, at, you know, older traditional universities, because you have boundaries, we don't have those kind of boundaries, we don't have that kind of history. So we should exploit that because I think that's, that's something that we, we uh, could benefit from um, keeping in mind that you have to be knowledgeable and experts in the, the the respective fields as well of course you can't be just shallow and broad you have to be deep as well uh, but but i think that's something that we should all strive to do and and, and do our utmost to to um, to make sure happens and, and and that goes out to all of us you know you sorry i should you know share your knowledge with all of us you know invite people to events like this and and you know, presentations of your work, uh, the, the discoveries you've made, the questions you have, the challenges you face and so on. I think that's, that's really academia for you. Uh, and I think that's what we should do. Yes, sounds very interesting. And uh, although we said a lot for the students, this event was mainly focusing for PhD students as we are PhD students. Would you say a final remark for the PhD students or students in general? Ah, I, I, I think that I have to say to the PhD students, uh, I'm really proud that you're here. I'm proud that you have chosen us because it's a choice. And I'm proud that you are the next generation of you know, researchers that will develop new uh, knowledge, new experience that will change the world. I mean, you will be the next 
managerial level here at, 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 and at other places. You will be the guys that, you know, uh, explore the new knowledge that would change the world. And I think I'm really proud of being part of that. So I think that's probably the take home message for, for today. Yes, this sounds very inspiring. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, I would like to thank you for uh, this interview. And now we want to open the floor for the audience if they have questions. Uh, so please um, post your question in the chat. Oh, Stan wants to talk, is it? Uh, Stan is raising a hand, but he's muted. Sorry, sorry, I'm back. Um, as an emeritus, I like to talk, so I, I'll do that. I was, you compared a lot between Hred and, um, and uh, England from your studies time, but what about your management time? Um, you've been uh, some time, at least in union shipping, how would you compare COVID and union shipping from two viewpoints, I guess, the, uh, the research environment that you observe and the management uh, you have performed? The, the management aspect is, is, is rather easy to compare. You know, they are, we are, uh, you know, an authority. Uh, we are, uh, we are working on the different laws than University of Jönköping uh, University is doing because they are foundation, they're private in a sense. So they have much more leeway and opportunities to do things that we, than we have. They can own stuff. They can own student buildings. They can own, you know, companies. They could support their researchers to build companies and own them together with the, with the researchers. We can't do that. We're not allowed. Uh, but that's something that I hope to change. I'm working quite hard now and, and very, very um, engaged in the fact that we should have the opportunity to have a holding company that we actually could do that too. Uh, and I hope that that will happen. But that was really inspiring in Jan Shipping. They have different uh, opportunities in, 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 in the fact that they are a different, you know, kind of uh, organization. When it comes to when it comes to the research, I think in, in Jönköping, it was they had, uh, for instance, the, the International School of Jönköping International Business School, which is really really uh, international uh, in the sense that they are. They're, they're work, working all over the world. They have sites in, in other parts of the world that they are working together with. And that's something that we could learn, I think. We could learn uh, from their interna internationalization efforts uh, quite a lot. Uh, and also um, in the engineering uh, school or school of engineering in Jönköping, they have similarly to what is common within uh, healthcare and, and uh, teachers' education? Yeah, they had you know, work in in, uh, in in the hospitals uh, in the school. They had uh, a mandatory part of the education for engineers was to be uh, in in industry and collaborating with with companies. And that's nothing that we have to that extent. So that, that's something that we could could um, learn from and 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 build from. I think. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it seems we don't have more questions in the chat. Then we would conclude this interview. I would like to thank Lars uh, for this for accepting our invitation. I would like to thank everybody for attending this, and I'm glad that uh, it's my pleasure that I held this uh, interview. So thank you, everybody, and have a nice day. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.